Welcome to the Landscaping Podcast. My name is Joel Barnett and I am your host. And today's episode is the first one of the year and it is a cracker to start the year off. We've got Michael McCoy from Michael McCoy Gardens and he's a extremely passionate person and a hell of a lot of fun to talk to. So uh, the, the chat goes for about an hour, but I could have easily gone for, for two hours. And yeah, there's just, he's just like he's a um, garden designer, writer, and also host of the TV show Dream Gardens when that was on. And it's obvious that he's he does well on TV because he can talk really well and tell us a great story as well. Uh, there's a couple of stories in here which I love, especially the one about his time at Great Dixter and and how that came about, as well as the Dream Garden story about how he got that role. Um, and yeah, it's just it's crazy how sort of sliding doors can happen and um, sort of saying yes to the right opportunities and asking for things that you're not offered, sort of things. And it was good to hear how he talks about the when he's designing a garden, the importance of designing it so that for a particular client so that they can maintain it. So whether they're going to maintain it themselves or have a garden to maintain it, that's going to dictate what he does in that design. So uh, there's yeah, plenty of good tips to learn from Michael as well as just hearing his amazing story. So hopefully you enjoy this chat with Michael McCoy. Michael, thank you very much for joining us on the Landscaping Podcast. My first question for you is how did you start in the industry? Yeah, I, I think as a kid, well, as a kid, maybe as a mid-teenager, like maybe 15 or something, I got obsessed with the idea. And I honestly can't imagine how this really came about, but kind of got obsessed with the idea of subsistence living, of, of some really simple life connected with the soil and the seasons. You know, like I, probably some kind of romantic aspect of my character. I don't know, but I, I love the idea of some simple kind of farming from 200 years ago, like the, the looking nothing like existing farming now. And so I had these romantic notions about just living a really super simple life, subsistence life. Fairly quickly got disabused of that, you know, the, the notion given the impossibility of that, but never lost that sense that I wanted something really simple and really connected. You know, I think it's, a, I think actually it is a real craving for connection. And, and connection with something bigger than myself, with something to which I must humble myself, really. And uh, and so, but there was never any sign of any interest in gardening or horticulture at all until I just finished my um, HSC as, a, as it was in Victoria at the time. So 1981. And I, my dad had to go to hospital for, um, for a really standard um, duodenal ulcer operation, they botched it and he ended up dying um, some months later as a consequent, direct consequence of this. And during that time, I, I stayed home um, during the school holidays between school and uni in order to drive my mum into the hospital each day. I was a learner driver and it gave me a chance to clock up some hours. And anyway, um, I, because I stayed home, I was just looking for stuff to do around the house. And my mum had been previously propagating little cuttings of an indoor plant on the windowsill. And, and I just, like, as a, I was a bit of a science, science nerdy kind of kid. I loved science stuff. And all my subjects at school were science and maths. And I, uh, and I just couldn't believe that, that a, a plant broken off, an aerial piece of a plant broken off could find, become a self-sustaining organism, you know, that, and, and that it had within itself the ability to create roots and become an, its own little independent plant. So I got curious about this and started to propagate stuff until in the end, I uh, my mum's huge veranda was covered in plants I'd propagated, and I had no interest in what happened to them after that. And then after a while, I just thought, oh, look, I better stick some stuff in the ground and you know use some of this stuff up. And that got me questioning about the good ways and bad ways to do that, to go about planting. And I have not stepped off that particular learning curve ever since. Like that's, you know, uh, 40 years ago. And, yeah, I haven't ever wanted to step off that learning co curve ever since. It's been amazing. Yeah. It's funny you say that about propagating because that's what, that was where one of my first passions came in because I was studying horticulture because I knew I wanted, to, I wanted to get into landscaping so I thought that would get me a foot in the door. Right. Uh, and when I was studying horticulture, propagating was my favourite class that we did because I was just so fascinated by it. And I couldn't believe if I, th I thought if other people knew how cool this was, there'd be a lot more people interested in it. Like, hey, you just get heaps of plants. Like, you can buy one plant, grow it, and then take heaps of cuttings and you multiply it. And so many different plants to use. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and and it, and I, I've never been very good at it. I've got to say, partly because I'm not very good at looking after stuff. Like, 
I'm, I'm quite good at instigating the process. Like I've just, uh, oh, my wife's getting grumpy with me there because there's containers of seed from tulips and crocus sitting on my, on the the um, dresser over here. And uh, I know uh, with full enthusiasm, I'll go and, and carefully plant those in a pot and put gravel over the top, do all the things you have to do. But I know that I'm going to have to look after those for at least three to four years before they go in the garden. And I know somewhere about between what year one and two, I'll kind of forget it, lose a bit of interest and they'll get a bit full of weeds, and, you know. So I'm not a great nurturer, but I love, I'm, I've am i never lost the the interest in the idea of growing stuff from seed and cuttings. Yeah. 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 That's the challenge of it is that's getting it to, to strike. And then once yeah. you've done that, it's kind of like the, the hard part's done. But Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you got to follow through. Well, if it, if it's if it's plants that you want in your garden, with something like these species tulips, the stuff I definitely want. You know, I can only afford to buy five or ten of them. So by growing them from seed, I can end up with hundreds. But I just find it I just find it so hard to stay interested in those <laughs> intervening yeah. years. Meanwhile, I'll be sowing the next year's seed. Yeah, yeah. The point of sowing is my highest point of interest. Beyond that, I you know it's this diminishing scale of commitment. Yeah. <laughs> so what was what did you study at uni when you went there? So I was planning to, during my HSC year, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I thought, well, I'll aim high in order to give me the most, the broadest options, you know, when I do decide. So I decided I'd target um, vet science and I didn't quite get the marks to get into vet science. So I did a, a general, started on a general science degree with the intention of crossing across into, into vet. Uh First year at, at Melbourne Uni doing a science degree, I discovered this subject called botany, which I, I like, I if someone had asked me what botany was, I would have known, but it never had crossed my mind of being something I might be interested in. But having this this newfound love for, for plants and gardening, botany was, I mean, botany has almost no relationship with horticulture as such, but it touched enough that the, there was enough of the a crossover in the Venn diagram for me to go, hey, I'm, uh, this is a really, this really takes my fancy. So I ended up finishing my science degree with a botany major and abandoning any thought of doing vet science. And during that time, just went, I just want to be a, I want to be a professional gardener for the rest of my life. That's what I want to do. Of course, nobody studying botany ever thought, you know, there was never ever a logical step from from botany. Botany was about a life of really academia in in one way, and that's where I imagined initially where I might end up. Um, but decided I wanted to become a gardener, and that I wanted to do a gardening apprenticeship. So I went from a science degree, finished that, and then did a gardening apprenticeship, which is of course exactly the you know that if there was any logical way of doing those two things, you'd do it the other way around. <laughs> but anyway. And just decided I wanted to be a gardener. And I don't think I've ever really wanted to be anything else, actually, as than a gardener. And that my design work, my life as a designer, which is now goes back 27, 28 years, is largely as a consequence of it's the closest thing I can be to being a gardener that pays enough for me to have a family. Yeah. <laughs> Frankly, you know, that that professional gardening. You know, I, I had a good job, but I was never going to earn, any, earn more than 30 grand. This is 20 years ago. So there, I just, it was never, ever going to be much better than that. And I had a young family coming, you know, that arriving, accumulating, and just when I, I've somehow got to make a step, use my skills in a way that pays a little bit better than this. But to this day, I, I, I even my own garden is testament to this. Is that what, what I what I really love is the actual hands on gardening, and the um, a kind of I guess a kind of degree of sophistication and difficulty level of horticulture. And as a designer, as a professional designer, I'm having to install pretty much bulletproof gardens for my clients. Uh, I mean, even those that are and I have had some great clients who are keen gardeners, I need to make sure that everything I design is well within their capability or the resources to look after. Um, whereas I know for myself and in, in all the gardens I love most in the world are really pushing those boundaries to say how, at what kind of difficulty level, how, how, how carefully can we time the flowering of these things so these things flower after one another and these things flower at the same time to get colour schemes going and you know, a good range of textures and all that. I, I love all that kind of level of sophisticated horticulture, 
but it's really just not practiced here in Australia. There are very few opportunities in Australia. And so like I practice like that at home, but I but de- designing doesn't give me a lot of opportunity to build anything of any real difficulty level in. Now, that's not to say that one of the great challenges for me has been trying to work out how do I take something that appears to be or that comes from a place of difficult horticulture but can be distilled down to something more simple and that that I feel like that the best of what I do in my design work is stuff that is is only the consequence or the result of the years of high difficulty level horticulture that I've practiced and within that you find the best paths to beautiful simplicity to really satisfying simplicity you don't find simplicity by only studying entry level you know you find simplicity at a level of proficiency you know that the best the best wordsmiths who can use words really beautifully and simply don't use them simply because they don't know better words they use them simply because they're using the exact right word at the exact right time mm-hmm. and that therefore for me i feel like my my design work has benefited from my pursuit of high difficulty level level horticulture even though i can't practice high difficulty level horticulture in what i design yeah there was a, a video on your youtube channel where, that from three years ago where you were reading excerpts from your your first book which i think was 23 years ago now that you released that one the michael mccoy's garden and in that i saw a clip where you, you said a similar thing where um, when you're the benefit of you doing your own garden is you can try different things and and you know push the boundaries a lot more. But when you're designing a client's garden, you've got to go for the safer options, uh, and it's so true. And I had uh, Tim Pilgrim on an episode, and I, I saw a couple of gardens on his Instagram that I brought up to him about how amazing they looked. And with both of them, the client gave him a like, carte blanche and just said, "We want you to do whatever you want." So they so he just went do whatever he want, and that was the best gardens. So. It's yeah. It's interesting how you can be restricted a little bit by clients' gardens, but if you if you get let go a bit more, then you can get a better result sometimes. Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah, it, it it's a it'd be a really interesting discussion actually. Um, how, um, what describe the perfect client? You know, would be an interesting discussion as a, a landscape or a designer. Because for me, I decided about 10 or 15 years ago that my perfect client was a very keen gardener, a keen home gardener, whereas I know that 15 years before that, I would have thought the best client would be someone who knows so little. They just go, oh, I don't know what to do. You just do. You make your decision. You just you just do whatever you like. Because the people who don't know anything and give you carte blanche, often you've got to limit the range of your the whatever the the difficulty level of maintaining this garden unless you are also going to be the maintenance person and i imagine with someone like tim it probably is he probably is maintaining those gardens and so that would be the perfect thing i've never maintained the gardens of my design because most of them are not within even driving easy driving distance of home uh so I've, i'm always restricted then by the the proficiency level or the resources of the owner uh, and for me my most creative freedom i think comes from several clients of mine who are garden lovers but come to me saying well actually there's, there's a few different there's like three different scenarios that one was a guy in sydney amazing very well known uh guy in the media but who who's who i turned up in his garden and i said to him look this is an amazing garden you don't need me this is incredible you're clearly a really good gardener and he just immediately went, no, no, you don't understand. If this garden is only as good as I can make it, I'm never going to be happy with it. You need to make it better than I'm capable of making it. That, that was that was lots of fun because he was a good gardener anyway, but he let me go to, to improve things. Then I have, had a client once who rang me saying, it was after an article that I'd published in The Australian Gardener, which was a kind of really heavy, glossy magazine back in the, must have been the late 90s. And she said to me, oh, did you design the planting in that article you wrote in those photos? And I went, yeah, yeah. And she goes, well, I want nothing like that. But she said, if you're capable of that, I know you'll be capable of what I want, which was really interesting too, you know. So, And and then the third one was, it was a client who rang me saying, you know, as far as I can see from Michael McCoy's garden, that book, 
uh, your style of perennial use of sort of, you know, naturalistic perennial use is what we're after. Please come and execute that at my place and didn't put any restrictions around, you know, there was limitations around in the fact that she had chased me because of my capability of doing that. But having identified that, let me do what I want. So each of those three scenarios were fantastic, but each of them were for, for, for people who intended doing the work largely themselves in the garden and that uh, but had a degree of proficiency but knew their limitations and hired me in order to exceed or to break out of their, their perception of their own limitations. Mm. Yeah, the, and the best gardens are the maintained ones as well because they get better with age. So because yeah, the ones, my favourite ones are all maintained professionally. Um, right. and, and there is one we just did recently actually and I had a similar comment to you when I walked in there that their garden was one of the best gardens I've been in. Or it definitely was the best garden I've been in that we hadn't started on yet. Right. It was a phenomenal garden. Yeah. Um, but she just wanted something different. So yeah. And then and so then we ripped out a lot of stuff and now I'm excited to see how it looks as the years progress because she'll I know that she'll look after it amazingly. So um but yeah that's like I've always said the most underrated thing within landscaping is maintenance. Oh. Absolutely. It's everything. It's every it's everything. You know, that that I mean, I've often likened it to to the idea that basically what I'm handing over as a designer is a newborn baby. And and in exactly the same way as handing a newborn baby over to someone, you would have you're entirely leaving in their hands the out their their adult outcome. Mm -hmm. You know, that you may have put some good genetic material into that, <laughs> into that baby. You might have nurtured the pregnancy in such a way that what you're handing over is something with maximum potential for good, healthy outcomes. But you know the person, the person nurturing from that point is going to totally frame the outcome. And there, and there are going to be obviously uh, behavioral factors in there that are personality factors that have been built in there right from the start but the level and the quality of the nurture is going to be what dictates the outcome. And, uh, and it's one of the things that every designer I know, every designer I know is more or less frustrated or at least limited by their understanding of the quality of maintenance that what they're designing will get and that they have to design within safely within the boundaries of the capabilities of whoever the owner is going to hire or, or of the capabilities of the owner themselves. And for me personally, I'd much prefer to deal with the capabilities of the owner themselves, partly because they're often extremely teachable, that they'll, they're hungry to know, well, how, would, how do I look after this? Two, they're not, they don't usually have the same time restrictions as someone who's coming in from the outside to professionally look after who's coming going, I've only got two hours a week to do this. How I, I, you know, it's way beyond. So I can only maintain it up to a certain point. So owners don't usually have that. But thirdly, I think that owners have an ability and there is something about the quality of ownership that means that they can inject some kind of personality and love and idiosyncrasy and passion into a garden that no one but the owner can actually do. You know, I've, I've never been into a professionally designed garden that is professionally and externally maintained that I love in the same way as I'll walk into a garden either created by, either designed professionally but maintained by the owner or designed by the owner and maintained by the owner that might not be nearly as clever in its design but carries the personality of and the richness and the passion of the owner over the top of just some professionally outsourced project, you know. Yeah, yeah that's what I like when the clients get involved to a certain point in the process as well because then they get more buy into it so they have more involvement and they care about it more. Totally, yeah, yeah. Uh, there was a, an Instagram post you did uh, quite a while ago. I don't, it could even be more than a year, but it was when you were at uh, Great Dixter. It was quite. Um, so, w at what point did you head over there, and how did that come about? Man, that that like that is just. It's now thirty three, thirty two years ago. Yeah, but the with every passing year, it becomes less and less believable to me that it ever happened. <laughs> I mean, I I was 
uh, as an apprentice, you know, I think about my second year, I had decided that I'd made a big mistake, that this this life plan was not going to work as as planned. And partly it was because I had I'd got swept up in the all the passion of amateur gardening. And I expected naively, I mean, I was only 20 or 21 at this stage. I'd expected that if the amateurs have this degree of passion, imagine how much passion the professionals must have. <laughs> I've since realized that in so many field artistic pursuits and creative pursuits, actually the amateurs are carry most of the passion and the professionals often. Uh, and it, look, the industry is quite different now than it was 30 years ago. That's for sure with that. There's a lot more passion in this industry than there was back then. Anyway, I decided I'd made a big mistake and that that I I needed to make, um, a, I guess, an escape route. And someone handed me a couple of books. A volunteer at Rip and Lee, where I was doing my where I was doing my apprenticeship, handed me uh, a couple of books, saying, "Oh, look, you might these might you, these might interest you." I had no interest at all in reading them, but I I politely took them had a glance at them thinking, oh, there's probably four to six weeks worth of reading in these, so I'll keep them for that long. And then the night before I hand them back, I'll have a quick look inside and, you know, so I can make some knowing remark. And uh, so the night before I went to hand one of these books back, I flipped it open and in the introduction found a window through to everything I'd been looking for in everything that I had despaired of finding in horticulture was summed up in this one one paragraph uh, i i just uh, it was like everything i needed to put me back on track to say this is how i've always wanted to garden this person this author is my man you know like this and and the book was by this guy named christopher lloyd who i'd never heard of before who just obsessively read this whole book asked if i could borrow it for a few more weeks obsessively read this book realized that he was a very famous author uh, that he'd been writing for Country Life magazine in England for every issue for about 30 years. My employers at the time were um, subscribers to that magazine, so I grabbed all of their old... And anyway, I read everything I could read, or I could get hold of by Christopher Lloyd. And at some point, made contact with him via mail, snail mail in those days, and we struck up in a correspondence. He was a great letter writer. And I had just started writing for the press a little bit earlier than that for The Age in Melbourne. And so so two writers to some extent writing to each other. I love it. It was amazing correspondence. And then I told my employer that I was going to, he, he said to me at one stage, look, we love the work that you're doing. And if you'll stick around with us for at least five years, maybe five or 10 years, we'll build you a house and really look after you. you know. And I went, well, thank you very much. But actually, I'm going to resign next year and go and work overseas. I'd planned this year away. And he goes, no, no, if you go for a shorter time, I will pay your airfare to go overseas and I'll pay your wages while you're away. <laughs> and uh, so so in the end, I was able to volunteer to go and work at, at Great Dixter, the home of Christopher Lloyd. So this guy who I who was this distant voice, this amazing distant voice of this guru in my life, then became a correspondent and then became my housemate, so to speak, um, when I moved into his incredible 15th century half-timbered manor house, when he realised, uh, he said, oh, look, when I asked if I could come and work for him for a summer, he said, oh, yeah, I'll come, I'll pay you. And I said, you can't pay me. I'm being paid by my employer in Australia. He said, well, in that case, come and live with me for the summer. And I'm just like, I mean, this this just doesn't happen. This guru, it it, it is exactly the same as a, as a, to me, as a musician being asked to live with Mozart or a painter with Picasso. I mean, you know, so just this crazy opportunity. And I was still very much in gardening mode rather than designer mode at this point. I'd, I'd really, my life was in in professional gardening and my in, with the intention of working in a single garden um, for, in, in, by necessity, of probably a, a wealthy client, but one who was themselves committed to a really good gardening outcome. And that's the employment situation I was in at the time. And it was under that sort of situation. This employer paid for me to, to pay my wages and it might air fare to go to England for four and a half months and work with Christopher Lloyd. So we then became really good, good buddies. And we started, we kept writing for the next 10 years or so. He was in his seventies at that point. I was in my late twenties. And so I went back and visited him many times. He died in 2006 and ever since then, I've kind of had this arrangement where 
it, when I when I'm in England, I basically got a a bed assured for me in this incredible <laughs> 15th century half timbered manor house in this amazing garden, which goes from strength to strength under its current uh, leadership of of a, a guy of about my age who became the head gardener there. Uh, Fergus Garrett since become an international superstar. And, uh, you know, we're good mates. And Christopher Lloyd, when he died, said he always wanted the house to be available for his friends to stay in um, when they go went back there. So, yeah, just like just the most ridiculous opportunity that was so perfectly timed in my life and also timed in his life because there was only probably about 15 years in his life after his mother died that he had the house to himself and he really took up this thing of really that forming this incredibly broad worldwide circle of gardening friends and having them come to stay. And he taught himself to cook well into his 50s. He eventually wrote cookbooks, having, but but so would have these amazing house parties every weekend with a house just full of people from the arts, but largely from horticulture. And so that was my life for those four and a half months. I mean, this crazy, crazy opportunity. Yeah, it's insane how lucky that is as well, like a sliding door moment. If you hadn't opened up the book and just given them back, that, that all doesn't happen. I I know I know I just I I cannot I you know yeah there's there's so many implausibilities in there and you know I can tell by the way you're speaking and your passion for this subject too that you that um you know we share a, a great love for this and and I am just so aware of the privilege it is to have for me at age seventeen for someone to have handed me this kind of wrapped up gift of of a of a obsessive passion for horticulture to hand this to me and for me to have unwrapped it and thought oh this looks kind of interesting and then to have gone through various years of slightly abusing it not quite looking after it or nurturing it and then realizing no this is the best thing i've ever i've ever been given and then having honored that gift and and pursued it for it to just get a for it to just grow and grow and grow and become more and more valuable to me over the years, and and I just think back now, because uh, I'm the I'm the parent of three adult kids, and and what you badly want is for your own children to likewise discover some point of passion that can consume them and consume their life, regardless of its of its commercial benefit or value, but that that's something that they can for the rest of their life chase with that beautiful sense of being constantly rewarded and yet whilst being rewarded, becoming more and more engaged and more and more curious with each passing year. Incredible. Yeah. I remember when I was growing up, like I was always a big AFL fan, a sports fan, and you'd hear like a, a person, like a, a top sportsman, and, the, and the, they'd get interviewed and they'd say, what do you want? Do, do you want your kids to follow in your footsteps? And they'd always say, oh, I don't care what they do as long as they're happy. And I never never realised the importance of that until I had my own kids as well. And then it's exactly like you say, it doesn't matter what they would do, but you just want them to be able to do something where they've got as much passion as what you've got for for what your passion is. Well, and and in addition to that is a, a passion that has the ability to last your lifetime through. And, that, and that's where, quite frankly, the sporting passion, I mean, people who achieve a certain elite level of sportsmanship often do get the opportunity then to to build a life upon it, even when they're no longer achieving at the elite level. But for me, I'm really glad that I've uh, I've been consumed by something that, at least theoretically, I can be at my absolute best, you know, the week before I cark it. You know, like I, I, I can be at my most knowledgeable and and have the best, have, have the most answers to questions, but still the best questions, the biggest questions in my head, right up till the last moment. I mean, how lucky are we to yeah. have discovered that? Yeah. And you hear other people, like, oh, because I listen to a lot of business podcasts and they talk about how you need to be out, you need to switch off from work and you need to stop thinking about things all the time. But if you love what you're doing, then you don't need to. Like on the, the first sentence on your website, I think it says something like, for every hour I've spent working on a garden, I've spent 10 hours thinking about garden. <laughs> so if you love what you're doing. I'm sure I've got the ratio fairly substantially wrong now, and it's probably more like about 100 hours to one. <laughs> I mean, it's basically, I just am never not one way or another pondering something about, you know, either some question of, okay, what is the exact right plant 
that is going to form the basis of this particular planting right through to some kind of bigger kind of philosophical question like for me right now thinking okay i'm obsessed with the natural movement of naturalistic planting happening in the uk and throughout europe but it's mostly driven by herbaceous planting and given the fact that we don't have a huge range of herbaceous plants in Australia, we have a, and a lot of Australian natives are on at least available through commercial markets are woody plants. Mm. How can I, and is it possible to take the aesthetics of a meadow and translate it into a woody system? And I know there are other great people thinking along these lines, like people like James Hitchmore, who've done the Woody Meadow Project with John Rayner from Melbourne Uni. There's some really good minds um, pursuing this, but it's something that I can just think about endlessly. I've got a head full of questions about at all times. And and uh, so it's a lovely it's a lovely question to fall asleep to, you know. Yeah, there's plenty <laughs> of worse things to be thinking about. Yeah, definitely. So where did the design side of things, when did that start and how did you move into that? So I worked for this family in Melbourne for nearly 10 years in there. They had two gardens, one in Turek and one in Mount Masson. They had staff in both and I was the manager of these gardens. And I loved that. It was amazing. Really steep learning curve. And who, who's ever going to complain about an employer that pays for you to go to the UK for four and a half months and pays your wages while you're away? But, but there, there came a point where I knew my learning curve was kind of plateauing. There was the challenge of how do I make this? Uh, how do I make this pay a bit better? Like I've reached the ceiling. I don't know anyone who's being paid better than me, and it's still crap. You know, how do I derive a little bit more income from this? I reckon possibly now with the the conditions of gardening now, I might have been able to manage that. I mean, I always just kind of accept the reality. I was never going to be a high income earner. So, but but I knew I had to at least you know be able to manage feeding my kids. Uh, so there was that, but there was also the thing of going, I, I don't want to spend my life looking after gardens designed by the, the substandard in their design. And I, I had done some work, actually some um, really, I'd done some art courses in which I'd studied design of two-dimensional composition. And I became obsessed with the relationship between aspects of two-dimensional composition and of garden design. And so I started to think like, I really need to, but my, my plant love started to, the, 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 the idea of design and exploring the possibilities of design was on the rise as my plant love sat at a kind of a plateau. And ever since then, they've been sitting really alongside each other and that every time one pushes their head, the other kind of rises to match. But I just became obsessed with the idea of, why do I feel like I do when I step into certain gardens? When I was over in the UK, particularly in 1991, I went, spent six weeks just looking around, looking at two or three gardens a day for six weeks. My poor wife being dragged around with me. Sometimes just sat in the car park. She couldn't stand it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember stepping into this garden in Scotland and, and there were some, you know, blue poppies and some amazing plants there. And I'm going, oh, wow, this is incredible. And I step into this forgotten part at the back of this garden and something gripped me where I just went, oh, man, there's some, there is some magical quality in here. There's no magical plants, but there's some magical quality about the way this captures and holds me that's just so perfect that I, that I started on this kind of lifelong journey to try and understand what is it about the, the shell around me created by plants that can make me feel really kind of contained can make me feel kind of intimately kind of really safe or can make me feel exposed kind of dangerously exposed all these aspects of the of the proportion and the and the, the scale of these plants around me can totally change the way I'm feeling in my gut you know and so it it uh, it got to the point of me then thinking okay I've been obsessed up till now with ornamental plants and ornamental use of plants so plants with a high and ornamental value and composing them together for maximum ornament, ornamental value. And then suddenly went, this is more than just ornament. This is actually, there's something truly visceral in my reaction here. I'm, And it's about the shape of these spaces that I'm in and the way they capture and hold me. And that's often not about the ornamental planting. It's often about trees around me that may not have any ornamental quality. It's about this kind of superstructure, the skeleton of the shape around me. 
so I became equally obsessed with with the idea of design of of shaping and forming and manipulating spaces and then using what I'd been learning for the previous 15 years to decorate those spaces but I've come to a, an understanding of having two very clear two very clear two very different hats on with that of okay these this is the planting and this is the thinking that shapes the space and this is the planting and this is the thinking that decorates those spaces and and so it's been really fun having exploring a world in which those two holding both of those things in equal importance and balance and then and how did you go about drumming up work for the design side of things and and building the profile yeah uh, uh it it was relatively easy the job that i'd had uh, had a degree of profile about it because we used to open that garden to the public fairly well very regularly and uh, also i by the time i left that job and started up my own business i had been writing for the press for 6 years as a as a garden writer you know i wasn't writing largely about issues of design and wasn't spruiking myself as a designer but I had developed a bit of a following amongst a group of really keen home gardeners who who were who wanted kind of consultancy like help with just almost fine tuning already good gardens, and that is that that formed the basis of at least the first five years or so of my design work was was the stuff that arose out of I guess the profile that I had been able to develop in my time as a professional gardener. So all those things kind of fed into each other. But it's curious to me, I don't really quite understand how that worked when I think about it, how when I look back, I never advertised. So, yeah, everything came out of word of mouth. I never had too much work i mean at the time i did some work in sydney for a guy who said you know you've got to start advertising i'm going but why would i advertise if i'm if i've already got enough work and he's just going Ugh. he goes michael you don't advertise in order to get more work you advertise so you can choose the work you want to do i mean actually this is really that's really good advice but i never did and i always had my finger in several different pies like i about then i started leading some overseas tours for ross garden tours uh, I was writing for the press. I was writing for The Age and then end up writing for Your Garden magazine, writing for Sydney Morning Herald, right? So I kind of right from day one had this bit of a portfolio career thing going. And so the design was never, ever 100% of what I did. And, and I was really pleased that it wasn't because I don't know how it works for you, but I just find two or three design jobs at a time for me is, it, is enough to keep my brain almost exploding with with possibilities so the idea of doing what a whole lot of designers do well someone like miles baldwin told me the a couple of years ago he had, you know, had 107 projects on the go at that stage you know like i mean what i just don't know how someone gets their brain to work like that and and so also i think my my creativity for that is uh, i i reach saturation point quite early so it was really great for me to have a number of different a finger in different pies even though it probably never made a lot of financial sense it probably would have made a lot more sense back then this is like late 90s if I'd just gone I really need to do one thing and do it properly rather than do three or four things and, and have a finger in this many pies I don't regret the decision at all because it's that which has allowed me to then eventually do the TV thing. I, I don't. I would never would have been asked to do that if I had not also been writing and also already been a proven communicator. You know, yeah. so I'm 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 really I'm really pleased that I had that portfolio attitude, and it also meant that in 2005, my wife and I could do a role swap. She could go back to work full time. I became the primary carer for my kids and did the school lunches and did the evening meals during the week, but tucked whatever in my portfolio at the time was going in around all of that stuff in a way that if I'd had a serious design office with staff, I probably couldn't have done. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm really pleased I made that decision. Though Bernard Trainer said to me, to Bernard Trainer, who's an Aussie with incredible, incredible work in California. 
he he just said to me, I didn't really start making money till I employed people. And and yes, yeah, so to be a little office of one uh, as a designer is definitely not the most efficient way to turn it in, into an income, but it gave me the most freedom to do other things. So I've been really pleased with that decision. Uh, but yeah, it, it's it's interesting how that profile because one of the things everyone assumed that because I was writing for the age that this gave me this massive foot in the door that that I that, you know I'd be overwhelmed by phone calls but what I've discovered is that there are very few home gardeners in Australia who would read say the age garden pages of the time and they were pages in the 90s in the early 90s not just you know one article now on a Saturday uh, those people don't hire garden designers they do it themselves mm. and garden and the, the two worlds in Australia are quite separate. I've been really lucky to have some keen gardener design clients as I talk, spoke earlier, but very few designers do. Mostly people who hire designers in Australia, people who just go, ah, I'm going to clue what I'm doing. Ah, give it to Joel, give it to, I don't know, give it to Miles, give it to, you know? Yeah. And in doing so, don't really want to be engaged with that process. And so, uh, in fact, writing for the age did almost nothing, uh, al almost led to no work. But curiously, it led to the, probably the best jobs I've ever had. Never led to many jobs, but it led to the best jobs I've ever had, curiously. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's fascinating, isn't it, how, how that could work? Well, it's the same. Dan Pearson has said to me, I mean, Dan Pearson won gold at Chelsea year after year. And, and he said he basically never, ever got... He said, I, I never got a lot of work out of Chelsea, but the best the best work I ever got was out of Chelsea. And, and then you have someone like Philip Johnson who actually says that when he won the best in show at Chelsea's 100th year, that his phone stopped ringing for design work at home in Australia. So it's very, people, think, people, people think they're too expensive? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. Very curious. Yeah. yeah it's funny, though, because, yeah, everyone thinks – that you would get bucket loads of work and you'd you know, have to put on more staff and everything, but it can be people who were at the, at Chelsea and didn't, didn't meddle at all. They could get more work because everyone thinks they're more achievable. And yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it is, uh, it's a very curious outcome. Uh, but, but as a consequence, I, but I do put it into those two categories that it's say even that, that first book, Michael McCoy's garden, I was writing very much as a very fallible home gardener you know I wasn't writing as a professional at all as you'll well know if you've listened to that but, and uh so I in one sense I was aware that that my writing was not setting up a, a great branding profile as a professional because I I love talking about both my failures and my challenges and what I was yet to learn you know I and I was never interested as a writer to be writing from a place of expertise. I only ever wanted to be writing from a place of curiosity and questions. Whereas if I wanted to set myself up as the expert, the one with all the answers, I should have been writing as a, a writing as the imparter of wisdom, not as, as the fellow journeyman. That is what I chose to do. Uh, and I, I don't regret that decision at all. But yeah, it wasn't necessarily a great decision from a point of, if I was trying to set myself up as the, as as a designer of note, you know. Yeah, it's funny because that's that the style of writing you went with is going to be the more popular style for the readers as well because they don't want someone who's telling them what to do. They want someone who's one of them, show, giving them examples of what would work and what wouldn't work. Well, you, uh, it's interesting you should say that because I think there is a proportion of readers who do just want things simplified and to be told what to do. And, and magazines have nearly, Australian magazines particularly, have nearly always made this mistake of thinking that what people want is for everything to be demystified. Tell me what date to sow my sweet peas, you know, whereas my brain is saying, okay, you tell me to sow my sweet peas on St. Patrick's Day. Why is that the best time to sow, sow my sweet peas? And if I understand why, maybe I can understand how much I can bend those rules. I mean, this is the way my brain works. So if someone tries to simplify something, to uh, it tries to answer something in an oversimplified way to me or give me an oversimplified answer, I will be always be coming back going, yeah, but why is that? Like, tell me why. What is the thinking that led to that simple answer? Whereas uh, nearly all magazine editors think that what their readers want is to be just given the answer. 
I, I have fueled nearly all of my communication on the basis that that the mysteries of gardening are actually much more life giving than the answers than 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 to de to oversimplify and to talk about the mysteries and the stuff. Yeah, I'll tell you when to sow your sweet peas, but I'll also give you an idea of the well, well, why is that? Let me tell you what it is about their life cycle and how amazing they are that will leave some leave you with questions. Yeah, to, to remove your questions is not really to fuel your journey. Actually, the, the best way I can fuel your journey is to maintain your questioning heart and attitude. Sure, I can help you. I can get help you get to the best questions. Let's answer some of the simple ones so that you get, you get to better ones. But let's never get to the place that we haven't got a head full of questions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you mentioned dream gardens before. So how did that come about, the, the TV show? Because that was one of my, I absolutely loved it because not only do I like watching, you know, shows about gardens, but I am come from a construction background. So seeing, getting to see them built as well was an added bonus. Yeah, that was fantastic. I, so I was, I was sent an email by the researcher for the show who was employed to cast the gardens. The, that, the, the word casting in that, in that case is actually used even in the case of gardens, not just people. So I got this email saying, do you have any gardens that are going to be under construction between January and June next year? Uh, and for the first time ever, uh, like I just went, oh, I'm not even going to consider, I'm just going to pick up the phone and ring this person and go, this is crazy. You can't think about shooting reveals for gardens in June anywhere south of Sydney. You know, like you're crazy. That none of my gardens, no garden I will ever construct would be finished and ready to shoot in June. If there's one month in the year I would never let my anyone see my garden, it would be June. You know, it's that uh, in this is in Melbourne. So I had this rant to this to this researcher <laughs> and just said, well, I don't have a garden and I will never have a garden. That I love the idea for this show. It's a really great idea to do. There's almost no TV shows worldwide based on garden design. There's lots of gardening. Every country has their own gardening show. But so I kind of ripped into ripped into her in in the most good natured way. Like we were both laughing about this, and but in the end I said to her, "But look, if you're looking for a host, I'd make a damn good one." <laughs> and she <laughs> and she and uh, like uh, again with with the utmost tongue in cheek, really. And she said to me, "Well, look, I'm not doing the casting for that, but here's the guy to ring and say exactly, tell him all the stuff you've told me." So I did. He was the executive producer, and he laughed too. And said, "Look, your name's on a list here. I've got a short list for people who I'm, uh, who we are screen testing. So let's organise a screen test." And so they screen test quite a lot of people, as far as I know. And it was months and months. I'd long since gotten over the fact. I'd just gone, "Oh, that's obviously they've given us someone else. I hadn't heard for months." And then suddenly I get this call saying, "You know, you're the man." Uh, and that was at the end of 2015. And and I, man, I just loved it. it was it, we were shooting that for five years through to 2021 and uh, I just loved every minute of it it was it was it partly as a as someone who has worked on my own in this micro business at that point for 20 years they by their own admission were a little bit concerned that having worked on my own I wouldn't be either capable of or desirous of working in a team and TV is very much a team sport you know and I loved it. I just loved having one responsibility, one or two responsibilities to do well, and everything else was someone else's job. I, I loved it. It was great. Yeah, because yeah. I, I think Georgia Harper's episode was maybe the second episode, but Pretty that blew good. me away. Just even the fact that they mentioned the cost of it, because that project was four hundred thousand dollars on that one that she did, and that was yeah six or six years ago, or whenever it was. That blew my mind. Oh. I, I had I had landscape architects writing to me or ringing me almost in tears saying, thank goodness someone is talking about real budgets. In one sense, it, it may have been the demise of the show in some ways because I know that the ABC copped a bit of criticism about the elitist nature, but that didn't say it doesn't seem to worry them with something like Grand Designs. Yeah. It doesn't seem to worry them in sport. I mean... All sport on TV is more or less elite for it to be worthy of being on TV. Yeah. And 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 
you know, I occasionally would have people saying, can't you do just sort of like a low budget garden in, you know, one of the cheap suburbs and go, well, that's the equivalent of saying, why don't they make a TV show about my uncle Tom playing golf? You know, like who's going to watch it? You know, like by showing the best, you learn from the best and you can distill. And that we made a real point of trying to distill principles from anything we were learning. So it wasn't about in order to have a garden like this, you have to spend 400000 It was about saying, what are the aspects of this garden that that uh, what are the strengths of this garden that could be applied to gardens of any budget and of any size? And, and I think we did that a good job of that, of distilling those principles. But you're right, it was, yeah, there, there were landscape architects saying to me that they would have people ringing them saying, look, we've got about 30 grand to spend. We're thinking we'd really love a pool. We're thinking maybe a tennis court, you know, <laughs> like, but people had no idea and TV had concealed through those years of those makeover shows like, oh, we don't need to name them, the real makeover shows where they came in and did a garden in a weekend, the budgets were actually totally deceptive. You know, they would either source plants at wholesale prices that your average person can't. There were all sorts of additional helps in there and, and, and resources that your average per person can't can't source. So they were they made a point of making things look cheaper than they actually are. And I don't, I think that whilst those makeover shows that were a great service to get home gardeners to realize, to think just beyond problem solving and start to think, what do I, what kind of space do I really want to live in? They were great at that. They were, they were somewhat deceptive about the true cost. Yeah. And there's, it's unfortunately like TV is a business. So they've got to target the place that's going to get the most dollars and the most viewers. And the most viewers is when people see something that they think they can achieve, even though they can't. So you you can put on that four hundred thousand dollar garden and say you can do this for eighty thousand dollars, and that's just cost and sponsorships and all sorts of things. So it's not actually achievable, but more people will watch that and get interested in it. Well, yeah, except that that, that elitism is we're comfortable with that in other areas, like grand designs. Nobody with grand designs is saying I want to see a house being being built in the outer western suburbs of Sydney that's realistic. You know, that that there is an aspirational quality to that. But gardening does seem to be rather straight-jacketed, particularly home gardeners are somewhat straight-jacketed around it being a very everyman activity and that every part of gardening on TV should be something that's achievable for everybody. Now, I ideally that would be so, but I'm I'm more than happy, and all my life I've been happy to read the books of and look at the works of the best practitioners in my industry in order to learn the best principles and the best practices, I may never be able to execute them, certainly not in my own garden or even in some of the gardens that I'm designing. But by learning and distilling from the best, I, I, can, I can then make sure that at least the principles on which I'm building the garden uh, the highest quality principles that the thinking being applied is the highest quality. And all the time as a designer, I have people saying to me, you know, how much is this going to cost? Like we do a rough concept sketch and I'll say to them, look, at it all depends on whether we make those paths out of brick paving or beautiful hand split flagstones or gravel, the same path and the same design can be 20 times as much as the entry level is this best materials is this so we find we don't change the design to fit the to fit the budget we change the materials to fit the budget the design and the layout can be the same if we've got a lot of money let's get dry stone beautiful dry stone walls if we don't have much money let's use sleepers to make those walls you know so so but you can still in most cases do the same level at the same layout it ends up being the materials that yeah, dictates the budget not so much the layout. Yeah, and the good thing about plants is they're cheaper when they're smaller. So if you've got patience, yes. you can get get the garden eventually. And and uh, you know, it's it, it's uh, I'll spend the rest of my life, I, I guess, um, disabusing people of this, or at least getting people to realise that plants in any landscape project, plants are basically the cheapest aspect of it. You know, that, that you will probably be able to plant your entire garden for the cost of one set of stairs or one short piece of retaining wall. You know, that that the construction is is by far the most expensive, unless you're doing stuff like a whole lot of Sydney 
designers, you know, where you're helicoptering in full size palms, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. There's some wild stuff I get to see on Instagram that they do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Incredible. And the Sydney budgets just like, we, yeah, the highest budget we worked on with Dream Gardens was 450000 And there's a, a million bucks in Sydney is, is uh, I mean, I reckon it would be at least 10, more than 10, nearly 20 years ago that Michael Bates in Sydney said to me that he needs to find a million-dollar budget garden every week to keep his business going. <laughs> He's since admitted to me that it was a it was an exaggeration, but he goes, oh, at least once every two weeks or a month. <laughs> so you know, there's a lot of million-dollar gardens, a lot, and, and a lot more than a million now in Sydney, as horrific and scary as that sounds to a lot of the rest of Australia. Yeah, that's wild. Uh, you recently got back from New Zealand because you do garden tours over there. I think you're heading back again later, 2024. Yes, yeah. I, so I've been doing tours um, of the, the South Island and specifically around garden design principles for home gardeners who want to, you know, one of the things I've dis- discovered as a designer is there's a lot of homeowners out there who would love to get some guidance on good design but don't want to just hand it over to someone who is just going to take it over. And that there's a degree of alienation that occur, can occur between an owner and the garden that they ultimately receive if they don't have some strong input, you know. And so I offering various services and these tours to people who would quite like to design their own garden but want some really good principles. So we go to these gardens to be able to, each day we talk about our design principle and we, we go and visit one or two gardens that exemplify those principles. It's really good fun. Yeah, I went to New Zealand when I was uh, 19. So I was like on a Kentucky tour. I had no interest in horticulture at the time. But even I knew enough then that it was a beautiful country. So I can imagine the gardens would be insanely beautiful. Gardens. I mean, so there's a the National Rhododendron Garden. It's called Pukiiti. It's on the side of um, Taranaki in the North Island. It gets between three and four metres of rain a year. <laughs> so... Uh, and good volcanic soil. But there are other places that we visit. I've never taken a group yet to the North Island. That's for the first time next year, in 2024. But the, the gardens that we visit in the South Island, a lot of them are in much drier country and they're quite, and quite difficult, really very challenging circumstances. So it's not, you know, a good climate does not ensure a great garden at all. But golly, it makes plant growth easy. Yeah. yeah. You're standing there watching them grow. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, last question for you, Michael, is who do you think would be a good guest to have on the podcast? I think, can I, I'll, I'll give you an Aussie and an overseas one, all right? They're both Aussies. I, if you haven't spoken to Kurt Wilkinson yet in South Australia, you've got to talk to Kurt. Uh, what he's doing is is off the charts, groundbreaking, uh, coming from a place of, uh, as a top, professional topiarist, playing with perennials for the first time in a super difficult, challenging climate, bad soil, low rainfall, and and what he's exploring and doing is, is, what he's doing is amazing, but what it unlocks for me is what's really interesting. So it's not that I want to, I've no interest in creating a Kurt Wilkinson garden, exactly the same as his, but what he's doing makes me totally rethink what I'm doing, you know. And my overseas one would be uh, Aussie living overseas is Bernard Trainer in California. Incredible work, uh, extraordinary stuff, using using l- largely fairly low glam glam plants. A little bit like a lot of our Australian natives. A lot of what he's using is is um, plants from from tough climates that are not necessarily highly floral or really ornamental in any traditional way but just doing the most magical work. So uh, Bernard Trainer and Kurt Wilkinson would, would be my top picks. Oh, I'll definitely reach out to him. And if I can't get on, I'll get you to message him for me. Absolutely. But Happy- can't thank you enough for coming on, Michael. I absolutely loved your passion for the industry. So I was so excited when you agreed to come on. So thank you so much for doing that. And on behalf of everyone, everyone listening, I've got no doubt everyone loved the episode. So thank you so much for it. Thanks, Joel. And thanks for such great questions. It's been good fun. <laughs>